Welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. The biblical prophets wrote about the idea of a Mashiach or Messiah, and it is one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith enumerated by 12th century Jewish scholar Maimonides or the Rambam. According to Jewish belief, one day in the future, there will arise a dynamic Jewish leader, a direct descendant of the biblical King David, who will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and gather Jews from all over the world and bring them back to the land of Israel. Rabbi Ilan Herman explains the arrival of the Mashiach, the Messiah, and the resurrection of the dead. What we would like to address today is what does the Torah say about the end of time, the conclusion of history, the future? The Torah speaks of the past, it speaks of what we should do with our lives, but it also prepares us for what will one day happen. And regarding the future, regarding the end of days, the Torah says that there will come a time, a designated moment that God chooses when He will send the Messiah the Mashiach, as it's known in Hebrew, the Anointed One. This individual, the Mashiach, the Messiah, will come to the world as a human being, and he will be a pious, holy, really supreme, advanced individual, somebody like Moses. And this individual, this Messiah, this Mashiach, will herald the redemption. And at that time, the Messiah will be responsible for doing a number of things which will bring about what's called the utopian messianic era. Judaism is very careful about qualifying who the Messiah is. And so there are a number of characteristics that the Messiah must meet in order to be considered verifiable, true, and authentic. Some of those are that the Messiah must come from the tribe of Judah, as the Torah teaches. He has to be from the family of King David. He has to be an individual that is steeped and learned in the Torah. He will observe the commandments of God in its totality, but more so, he will be an individual that will encourage the world, bring people closer to the Torah, to its teachings, and to God, our Father in heaven. We will see soon what it is that the Messiah must do in order to fulfill his role, his mission, and to be an authentic Messiah. The first of those is the rebuilding of the temple. Judaism teaches that we've had two temples which stood in Jerusalem. Sadly, they were destroyed. The Messiah will be instrumental, the catalyst towards the rebuilding of this third temple in Jerusalem, in the location where the first two temples stood. We know that the Jewish people were banished far into the four corners of the world when the temple was destroyed some 2,000 years ago. And today, there are Jews that fill the world in so many different countries. At the time of the Messiah and the second fulfillment of his requirement is that he will bring about the ingathering of the exiles. Another phenomena that will happen at that very time is as the prophets state that the world will begin to reform itself. They will start to heed the messages of this Messiah, of this Mashiach, and they will start to acknowledge the true and one and only God, where envy, strife, and hatred will be abandoned, and where peace will be the order of the day between mankind, between nations of the world. At that time also, the greatest of the miracles that will occur is the miracle of the resurrection. In the book of Ezekiel, the great prophet Ezekiel speaks in chapter 37 about the valley of bones. This great prophet finds himself transported in this vision into a valley filled with bones. The bones are dry, the bones are remnants of the dead. And God says to Ezekiel, speak to the bones, tell them to come alive. And indeed he does that and the miracle occurs where these bones start to reconstruct and human beings are formed and suddenly you have from the dead the coming to life of human beings, the resurrection. 
the miracle of the resurrection is a time of great joy. It's a time when families will reunite. Those that had departed, that had suffered the trauma of loss, thought, will I ever see my loved one again? At that time, we will. At that time, we will see our ancestors, and it will be a time of incredible celebration, of incredible joy, a time in which all the horrors and the pain and the trauma of the past will be understood and we'll be able to celebrate together a time of unity, of love, of brotherhood. Israeli singer, songwriter, musical arranger, and conductor, Yonatan Razel, has blended all his musical skill and talent to produce a wide repertoire of music. Yonatan has traveled around the world, and he was recently in South Africa for the Sinai in Daba event. Simcha caught up with Yonatan in Cape Town to learn more about this phenomenal but humble musician. I actually grew up in a musical family. But besides that, we were Levites also. Levites is the, were the tribe that played music in the temple. But this came basically from my grandfather's, my father's side, grandfather said he was my cello teacher. He was a musician. It was a very musical home. And we all um, studied music and as child, my brothers and my sister. It's like you do anything else. You wake up in the morning and you practice. It wasn't even a thing I had to choose. It was just part of me waking up and listening to Stravinsky and Beethoven and Mozart uh, music in the, in, the, you know, in the house. And when I was 15, I started going to study conducting in the university in Jerusalem uh, Rubin Academy. And I basically started a career as a conductor. I went to the army in the middle and uh, started getting prizes as a symphony conductor. I studied composing, symphony orchestrating, and then I went, uh, started traveling the world, conducting and giving concerts. I was pretty good at it, also as a pianist, as a composer. Um, same time, I was also, I heard a lot of popular music, a lot of uh, jazz music, rock and roll music. Uh, that's my mother's side, more the American side. But uh, after the army, I, w I went to, I was accepted to Cambridge University in, in, in England to do my master's degree in composition. And I felt uh, something was wrong. Basically, I just think I, I didn't know who I was, you know? I didn't know what I wanted. I felt I was like on a train to somewhere where I didn't even choose where I was going to. Uh, everything was going very well, but I felt, you know, I'm not here. You know, knock, knock, where are you? Uh, did you want this? Did you choose? And I was doing music from very young. I was, thank God, very talented in it, so I was like pushed over from, you know, this to this, and I never really sat down and said, or even felt. And somewhere about me, there was like a, almost like a child saying, one second, one second, I was like, you're going into this career, you didn't really choose this. I felt I wanted to, 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 to you know, to touch people more, I think. At that point, I stopped my music career at all. I said, that's it. I want to be something else, and I went, uh, I went down south in Israel to be a shepherd. <laughs> I stopped uh, everything I did. I was working in the fields with animals, and I felt, you know, I need to connect to, to God and, and learn, 
learn about myself. I went to uh, like a therapy where I tried to, f you know, I felt I needed to find who I was before I go to the next step in my life. And all those years when I stopped and I was a shepherd, I went to yeshiva to start learning. And uh, I met a, a rabbi that I, I started learning on a regular basis and asking, you know, you know, why am I doing this? Should I, you know, and uh, uh, pretty much in the middle of all that, took a few years, I met my wife and, uh, and we started building our life together. <laughs> I would say that, you know, obviously there's another part of me, a big part of me, which is a husband and a father, uh, which I try to spend a lot of time doing. I'm not one of those artists who, you know, never sees his children. I'm home every day, a few hours, um, playing with my kids, playing music with my kids. It's a very big, big part of me is, you know, being, being there. Actually, now that I'm here in South Africa, it's one of the times in the past year or two that I left for so long, which is a week, which is devastatingly long for my family. You know, children, sometimes we as adults, we forget. We forget where we came from. We forget our history. But as a child, it says also in Pesach, every generation, you have to remember, we came out of Egypt. And then many, many years later, when my father sang, I was crying and came home and composed the music. Maybe for that little child I was. I felt very connected to Hashem as a child. I spoke and I prayed and I was a very spiritual child. Like, in a shocking way even, you would say. I wanted to keep Shabbat, to be observant. My family became religious, observant, when I was about five or six. It was a long procedure um, that my family went through. And slowly, let's say in the course of when I was, let's say, four or five years old till when I was about 12, those seven, eight years, my family became religious. Rabbi Nachman says that all the or our four mothers, Rachel, Rivka, Sarah, they're all very, it says in the Torah that they were very beautiful. So he says, why do they say that they're very beautiful? We don't need to know that they were very beautiful. He says, because their beauty, their inner beauty was shining out. It wasn't, only inner, it wasn't only external beauty, it was inner beauty. And so he says that when, machine, when at the end of the days, there'll be a connection again between internal beauty and external beauty. And I felt that I had to try to connect them. I didn't think of myself as a singer at all. I didn't, uh, I mean, I knew a lot of Woodstock kind of music and Sephardi music and, and growing up in music schools, I heard a lot of jazz, but I, I was more like a conductor, composer. But then I, you know, getting close to myself, started composing songs. And looking back at those years, I was trying to think what happened. I really felt that I wanted to use, in a sense, the vessels the instruments of the classical music, the, the knowledge, the craftsmanship, you would say, of the classical music, and using it into my, and blending it into my music. My music, I don't really know how to, how to describe it, you know, it's hard to describe music, it's like describing a sunset or something, but, uh, um, I feel that I, 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 I didn't refute or run away from classical music. My music used a lot of strings, a lot of counterpoint, a lot of the knowledge that I acquired when I learned music. I'm just maybe using a different language. I think the classical music gives you a certain kind of wisdom, many, many techniques that help you build a beautiful, a musical and melodic structure. And uh, the orchestration, the, using the instruments, the symphony instruments, all those things, the knowledge of harmony, uh, all these things are, are, are very deep in my, in, my, in my brain, in my heart, actually. And I, when I compose a song, it all flows in. 
It's not only the layers of music, but it's also the emotion they put into it, the, the craftsmanship of building the structures. My music, I think, is part of a group of musicians that are trying to combine Jewish music with, with, with regular popular music, sometimes classical, ethnical. You know, something like Shlomo Karlebach or, or just Israeli music or even popular folk music, which is more like simple, straight to the heart kind of music. <laughs> I'm the kind of artist or, let's say, musician that works hard, I work very, very hard. I don't just like, oh, it came to me, you know? It's not, I'm not like that. I sit, you know, with the piano or with the guitar or just sing and I work a lot. The moment when it comes, I never know when it'll come. You know, it could be, it's just, it's usually in the course of working and you know, playing around with harmonies and melodies and ideas. Suddenly something will be like, almost like take me, you know? It's more like just the playing with the, with the, with the material of music and, the, and the combining that with idea, like a spiritual idea or emotional feeling. Those, you know, making a loaf of bread, playing around, and suddenly you're like, where'd this come from, and, you know? If you'll be far away in the corner of the sky, I will come, I will come one by one. When I compose music, which is, so to speak, secular, which I have some songs like that, which are talking about emotions or relationships or, you know, just nature or life itself, I feel that, you know, God's in there. I will come one by one. Some songs are more like prayer, kind of liturgic, kind of, you know, searching for connection with, with, with you know, with beyond, with God songs, and some are more like just songs about, you know, emotion or about just the things that I'm going through in life, you know. You know, I'm a researching soul, I think. Uh, I'm trying to combine many things. At first, it's my search for a closeness to, to God, to Hashem. My life, I'm searching to be, you know, more true, more pure, a better Jew, a better person. I don't view music as, a, as being an artist or be having a career. Rather, I try to utilize music, first of all, maybe as expressing myself, but more to touch people, you know, to, to connect. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I see myself as a certain kind of, you know, messenger of, of, of living as a full life as, a, as an observant Jew. I try to make, you know, a synergy of, you know, worshiping of Hashem and doing art in this generation is, is a very big uh, dream for me, and I'm trying to be a, you know, a window into that world. I'd rather people go home and say, wow, I was touched, I, I, you know, rather than, wow, it was a great show, and it was technical. People go home in a quiet space and say to their wife or husband, you know, I, I, I went through something really good for me. That's kind of my dream. <laughs>
The path of hearing our inner voice is learning to reach a place of inner silence through prayer and meditation. And then asking the questions that we need answered according to our lives as they're unfolding. The Zohar HaKadosh teaches us that a question is like the peel of a fruit, and the answer is the fruit itself. We have to peel the fruit in order to get to the fruit inside. So too, we have to peel back a certain part of ourselves to able to reach the true answers within. The greatest obstacle on this path is belief in ourselves. A lot of people believe in God, but it's another thing to believe in ourselves. When I don't believe in myself, I'm sending out a message to the universe that something's wrong with me. Once I believe in myself, and I believe in my connection to the Creator, I open up the channel. The Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, prescribes for us a way to do this in a healthy, measured, balanced way. We start out by praying in the morning. We say Shema Yisrael, we declare that God is one. Then if we want to take on more, we pray in the afternoon. And we praise God and we thank Him for our portion in each day. We want to take on a little more, we pray in the evening. And so on and so forth. We gather, we add on more service, more practice, in our spiritual path. The idea of this path is to isolate the questions of the moment, what I need to know for now, where I need to be in the next 15 minutes, who needs my help next, where I can be useful to God next. When I break my life into those little moments, it becomes much easier to handle, and we're not afraid. I think it's very important to seek out people in your own communities who are like-minded people who share these ideas, to spend time with them, that your social life your, is, is focused on achieving this greater connection to Hashem through other people, like-minded people, who can reconfirm and affirm who you are and what you are and what you're doing. I want to bless everyone with that level of fearlessness because life is full of moments where it's easy to be afraid. But when we have this inner connection, the fears fall away. And then there's only one fear left, and that's the true awe of Hashem. Sadly, that's all we have time for for this week's episode of Simcha. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you join us. If you'd like to be in touch, please find us on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions and drop us a line. From myself, Eitan Berger, and the whole team here at Simcha, have a fantastic week and goodbye. <laughs>